our beloved. I invite you to pray with me as I take a moment to help us study the word of God from Galatians chapter 6, so read so beautifully. Thank you, Sister Beverly. You made it, you hit the points that I'm going to hit too. Amen. So let us pray. Beautiful, loving, and creative God, to you we come this day who has breathed life over chaos and formed it into life. You who have taken the spirit of God and have shaped and molded us so that we could be your vessels in this world to you, O oh God, who has given us, we who say yes to you, grace, we come saying thank you for that life-giving creative power that's within us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In these days, many things have been created, you know, more and more, I sometimes shake my head because I can't believe what's going on. This week alone, or the weeks to come, or the weeks that have been going on, I'm just like, Lord, what's going on? How is it that that which you have created that's supposed to give life is constantly destroying life every turn we look? How is it and why is it? constantly again and again and again just when we think we're gonna live we die I don't know about you and I don't know if I'm the only one but there have been moments in the last two years especially in this last week I've been excited and thankful and joyful and mindful and worshiping praising God saying hallelujah God you're good and those good moments but then there's been some bad and they've been moments more than seasons that I've been frustrated and restricted and anxious and struggling to just break free because I felt bounded by something that was far beyond what I could ever imagine. And in all these things, I was like, God, how am I going to make it through? I don't know if you've ever been in such a place where you have good and bad happening all at the same time and you're wondering how, and I don't know how you make it through, but I know for me, it's nothing but the amazing grace of God that allows me to be that amazing grace, that saving grace, that justifying grace, that redeeming grace, that uplifting grace, that grace that forgives and restores, that grace that is just so amazing. It gets into the nooks and cranny of mind, body, soul, and spirit and gives us exactly what we need and allows us to keep moving step in front of step, pace by pace, only but for the grace of God. In our text today that was so beautifully read, I intentionally chose the message version. It takes those words that we normally are used to listening to and brings it into everyday form. The book of Galatians, in case you did not know, was a book that Paul wrote to give to his folks when he started this church and he was trying to help the Gentile Christians become the body of Christ. And for the first five books, there's only six books in the entire thing, but in the first five books, he does again and again and again, does a simple teaching about justification by grace. And that the only reason why you are alive and you can be is because you have believed in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, because he came, he came with a redeeming, rescuing, restoring, transformation, grace, so that you can live everlasting. And that if you have faith, that's all you need. Because if you have faith in Jesus, that's all you need. And it was important to that community because they were in a season where the Jewish folks were telling them, look, you got to do all these laws in order to be a Christian. And they were like, uh-uh-uh. It's just by grace. If you have faith, then you have the grace of God. And if you have the grace of God, that grace and that spirit is in your heart as long as you believe who Jesus is. So that's what he was doing for the first five books. And then when he gets to chapter five, he then switches it just a little bit and lets them know about in their mind and spirit to understand what this grace is, how there are fruits that come with the spirit of grace. And you know those fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, generosity, faithfulness, self-control. Ooh, someone say self-control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But he talked about that all in theory. Then he comes to chapter six. He says, I've taught you all I can tell you. I hope you got it in your mind, regardless of what some other teachers are trying to tell you. But now let me tell you how you got to live this practically to be the church. And so I call this sermon living creatively because every one of us that have breath that is living has a creative spirit. We have the power, the same one that created heaven and earth. We have that spirit in us, moving us if we believe in Jesus. Hallelujah. And he says, live creatively. I'm going to pause right there. Because in this first section of the text, it's all about our view of ourselves and others. Live. Mm. Have you been living these days? Or have you been letting things dictate how you should live? Have you been living free and living to your fullness? Or are you limited and stagnated by things and people and places? Are you living these days? And if you're living, are you just going step by step? Or are you being creative and doing the things that God invites you to do? For those of us that believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and we have faith and we recognize that we are called to live because he has come to free us, mm. we have the power to live differently. When Paul was teaching this letter to the folks back in Galatians, he was trying to help them understand, look, what I'm about to tell you and what I'm about to share with you it might seem simple and ordinary, because it is. But not only is it simple and ordinary, it's actually supernatural in its life-giving power. And so when he told them to live creatively, and then he speaks about, well, how are we supposed to live with each other? Mm. If anyone falls into sin, forgivingly restore them, saving your critical comments to your. He was reminding us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and not one of us are perfect, but in that if we recognize who we are and what Jesus did for us and how we are forgiven, not only of our past sins or our present sins, but our future sins because of what Jesus did, we can be live in such a creative way that when we forgive others, they don't feel condemned. They're encouraged to keep going and living. And so there are some people that are doing wrong that need to be restored. And that word restore is simply kind of go back to the fishing time when they would take the nets and they would mend them to heal them. And a net catches and holds and carries. And so in restoring them, we would carry them and help share their burdens and to then fight for them if they were being oppressed and put down. And if someone was too low, we didn't just step on their head. We actually stood down and raised them up. For those of us that are living creatively, every time we choose to forgive, Every time we choose to stoop down, every time we choose to hold our comments to ourselves, every time we share in the burdens with one another, we are being the body of Christ and we are supernaturally changing someone's heart, their mind, their spirit, but more importantly, we are changing the attitude of this world. And if you think you're too good, don't deceive yourself. Because in this part, he's asking us to take a good view, a very deep introspection of who we are. Do you know who you are? I love Sanaa's song. I know who I am. Do you know Sanaa? You might know her other song that says, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise. She has a song. 
You notice I pause, right? For your benefit and mine. But she has a song that says, I know who I am. I'm walking in power. I'm walking in miracles. When you know who you are and know what you can do and who is working in you, you can do anything. But you have to begin to take an exploration of who you are, meaning that you need to look at all your awesome things and give God glory, but then you gotta check out those things that might need some work, or you might actually be the one that's sinning and someone needs to help lift you up because you're down. And in this time, when we're being the body of Christ, we shouldn't compare. I think that's one of the hardest things in the world. They make us wanna compare. They want to make us compare our job, our status. They want to make us compare what we have and what we don't have. They want to make us compare again and again and again. And that's the legalistic world's way. But we are not the legalistic world. We are the church. And as the church, we are called to be in the world and influence it. But we ain't supposed to act like it. And so... When you figure out who you are, you're good, you're bad, you recognize that you are called to do a work and do that work to your creative best. When I think about creativity and I say all of us creative, I believe that you are creative if you can do these three things. If you have a vision of what God thinks the world should be, if you know the word of God, and if you can move, then you can create. Let me say that again. If you have a vision of what the world that God wants to be, God's kingdom to be, and if you know the word of God, even if you got the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hey, that alone should hold you for a long time. But if you have the word of God, and if you can move, Jesus, Jesus, what can happen? And that's what he's saying. So take a good check in yourself, fix yourself by the grace of God, and then do the work that God calls you, not trying to impress anyone, not trying to compare yourself. Just take responsibility for the things that God is calling you to do your creative best that you can. So the only ask is that you do the best that you can by the grace of God. And by you doing the best that you can, I'm convinced that if you're doing the best that you can, and if you're doing it creatively, and you're doing it according to the vision of God, you're not doing it for yourself. You're caring for somebody. You're looking out for somebody. You're helping somebody. You're loving somebody. Somebody needs you, and hopefully you're showing up. But there's one other piece in this. I want to go back a minute. It says, bear one another's burdens. Share your burdens. I confess I'm not always good with that. Because I'll tell you right now, this week, pastor was sick. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I had a fever of 102. It would come and disappear. And I only told a few praying warriors. And thanks be to God, I'm here. But... Imagine what had happened if I would have shared my burdens. I wouldn't have felt like I had to cook for myself. I probably would not have to force myself to come to work. I probably would have asked for help and someone would have been blessed to help. I wonder why we don't share our burdens with one another. Why don't we tell someone that we are weak and cannot? Why don't we open our hearts and our lives? Does anyone have an answer? Because the Lord knows I don't know. Do you know why you don't share your burdens? Or do you share your burdens? Or do you have a specific crew that you share your burdens with? And that's good enough. I see a nod. So it's the specific crew? Then the prayer, everyone has a crew, yes? Oh, Lord have mercy. Virtual church family, I can't check with you. I don't know. Do you guys have a specific crew that you can share your burdens with? Because you got to share it with somebody because 
That song says, cast your burdens unto Jesus because he cares for you. But when you can't cast your burdens to Jesus and Jesus wants to send you help, they can't help if they don't know. But the church is different. In this house, we're supposed to be that. We are supposed to have this beautiful radical view of ourselves and others. And imagine how if we lived this life creatively and allowed those things to actually happen, how joy and peace and hope and righteousness and all those other fruits of the spirits would just be bubbling over and everybody would have need and no one would lack a thing. So he says, oh, I know that's not hard. It's simple to understand, yes? But is it easy to do? And so what he encourages us is to make sure that you by grace do it, but then you gotta make sure you know your word. Mm. I can't begin to tell you how many wonderful, faithful Christians that I know say, well, pastor, I don't read my Bible, or I don't know my word, or I know some of the words. I would say, baby, you need to know the word. Get the word of God in your heart however you need to get the word of God. And there are so many things to media today you could, if you don't want to, you could Google on, if you know how to get on Google, you can put a word and ask for a scripture that matches it and it will give you a list of scriptures that all you gotta do is print and read. Or you could put some gospel music in your ears and if you listen to the right gospel music, whether it's hip hop, whether it's old school, whatever your thing, whether it's reggae, whatever, whatever gospel music, if you listen to it long enough, you will hear the word God getting in your spirit. And if you're still not sure if that would work and you don't want to open your Bible or do a devotional, you can go talk to someone that looks like they know Jesus. And I'm sure if you talk to them long enough and tell them what's going on in your life, you, they could say, baby, let me give you a word from the Lord. But you have to make sure that the word starts to take priority in your life because what the word does, once it gets in you, it changes and transforms your mind, your heart, your spirit, your actions. It helps you see the vision of God so clearly and be clear about what you're being called to do so that you can then move with wisdom and grace. When we ask God of wisdom and God of grace, grant us glory, grant us wisdom. Hey, it's available. It's all so available. But this other part of the word is not just getting the word in you. It's watching the words that come out of you. There is life, power, and life in this tongue of ours. Everything we say has to yield something. Everything we speak it either gives life or it causes death. It encourages or it tears down. Sometimes you gotta speak life to yourself, but other times you gotta speak life to others. And so it's important when we get this word, however we use the word, that we use it by the grace of God in the right space and places and times so that we can make this world a better place. It's time for those of us that know the word to speak life to this world. Because once you speak it, then you gotta live it. If you speak it, you gotta be about it. You gotta speak it so that it can be what it needs to be in this world. And then it says to encourage those that share the word of God with you. Hopefully you're sharing it with one another, yes? Do you have a prayer partner? A Bible study partner, someone you hang out with, talk to about God, not just about your shoes or your money or your children. It's good to talk about those things too, don't get me wrong. But talking about Jesus and talking about what God has done and what God can do can bless someone and fortify someone's soul. And so when someone gives you a good word, then you gotta then be trained up and then 
Know that some of the words that come to you may not always be that what you like. Sometimes someone will give you a word and you'll be like, oh my God. But it may still be the word that you need. Because the word of God heals and restores. The word of God changes and shifts. Sometimes it cuts sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God does a good work, though. So may we be bearers of that good work. And every time we do that, we live in such a creative way that we help create spaces for God to get glory, honor, and praise. This living creatively is really not just about us and what we do. It's really about the next part. Because the next part of the scripture speaks about our view of the future. Hmm. It goes back to that planting and sowing, reaping and harvesting. Have you ever once say, you better watch what you sow? They make it sound like a threat. That's not what the scripture is about. Any gardeners in the house? I have a green thumb in the house alone and all of them I bought ready started. But a real gardener with seeds when you sow something, you expect to get it, yes? So there's no way you can sow a pumpkin seed and expect to see an apple tree. True? What you sow is what you reap. Have you taken a good look at the fruit that's surrounding you, surrounding our world? If I were to take a look at our world right now and wonder what fruit has been being sown in this world, I would say greed, selfishness, violence, evil, huh? Hate, intolerance, all those seeds are boldly being sown and multiplied. And then it's not only being sold once, it has multimedia to multiply it and to glamorize it and to emphasize it. All those seeds in the world are yielding its fruit all over the place. And I think, and I believe, Part of God's desire is that there is some new seed that gets planted out in the world right now so that what kills those weeds will be fruit of the Spirit. Because for all those things that we named, if love, joy, peace, righteousness, self-control hit those things, would they be? So it's time for us to start sowing sowing those seeds so that we can then reap the harvest not for ourselves but for God. So baby, I want you to sow your seed and be creative with it, be generous with it, be wild with it. Don't just give it a few places. You know that parable where the sower just goes just throwing good seed, just throwing it up in the air. I don't know any true gardener that does that, but God. But imagine the seeds that we have, love, joy, peace, righteousness, those fruit of the spirit, do they cost us anything? Meaning, did you have to pay to get them? You may have to pay to live it out. It might have to work out some things, but they're free to us and free to give and give in abundance and give generously so that God can do the good work. But some may say, and they did too, when Paul was encouraging the Galatian church, he said, so let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued in doing good. At the right time, we will 
harvest a good crop. Don't give up or quit, especially right now. In the NRSV it says, don't get weary. My guess for some of us in the world, life has made us weary. We've been tired and burdened by all the things that are happening and struggling and wrestling with. Some of us are running and not weeping, but there are some that are truly, truly, truly getting weary by all the things. And when they watch the news, they have even turned it off because they just can't take it no more. Because weariness sometimes, what it does to the soul and it speaks to where the condition of the heart and the life is, is that sometimes the outside gets louder than what's on the inside of you and it doesn't have anything to work with. Sometimes we get weary because the responsibilities and the burdens of our life just pulls from us, but we don't have the community or the people to help bear our burdens. And when we're weary, we don't have the strength. But the thing is, when we are weary, we're not alone. And when we are weary, we don't have to deal with it on our own. And when we're weary, you should know it's a choice. You could choose to be weary or you can choose not to let it get to you. Y'all looked at me like, Pastor, what you talking about? You could choose to be weary or you can choose not to let it get to you. And there's so many ways, we already talked about half of them on how you can help yourself not get weary. But when you want to really begin to turn this weariness around, you need to know that God understands you get weary because he said in your weakness, he would be your strength. So it's not that God doesn't think or know that doing the good work of God makes you weary. I know all of us do our good work in different ways, but I admire Sister Loretta in so many ways. I don't know how she goes through those folks. But by the grace of God, I believe. When you see the evil and the injustice in your face every day, it can make you weary. However, if you allow the creative God who wants you to live creatively, if you allow that creativity to bring a new vision of what can be, because sometimes what can switch the weariness around and turn it around is not the fact that what's there is just there. Yes, it is. But it's not all there is. There's always another side as long as there's a God. And as long as what before you does not look like what God says it's supposed to be, there's always an opportunity for it to turn around. And so you got to begin to speak life to those things that look like death. And you got to begin to encourage yourself and to speak to yourself and to remind yourself of who you are and whose you are and who got you and who loves you and who blesses you and who keeps you. You have to also make sure that you have a good community around you. And if you do not have a good community, first church, can we be that for someone else? Can we be that place that when anyone is needing anything that they could get what they need, could we be that place to help a weary soldier? And even if the only help is to cry with them, to hug them, to let them know that it won't be long. Because sometimes what makes you weary, it lasts a lot longer than you thought it would. But thanks be to grace. And what brings this all home is what I call the view of the cross. At the end of the scripture, it says, well, you should know a couple of things. Towards the end of the scripture, part of the reason Paul went from when, when verse 11 starts, Paul went from someone else writing the words of God for them to him writing it with his own hand. He chose to personally write this last part of the letter to the folks because there were some folks that were trying to make people get circumcised. 
You should know, in case you don't know, those that were trying to be circum making sure that everyone gets circumcised, they were the Jewish Christians. They were the ones that were Christian and they were Jewish and part of their faith was they were circumcised, but the Gentiles didn't come up the same way, so they were not circumcised. And the Jews were trying to make them do their law. But Paul in this last section says, wait a minute. You're trying to make them follow one aspect of the law, but you're not following all the law. And in making them follow this one aspect of the law, you want them to do the same thing so then that way you feel okay because you're doing just this piece and then they'll be more like you versus more like Christ because the law of Christ that they're supposed to follow is to love the Lord their God with all their heart, their mind, their soul, and strength and to love their neighbor as themselves. And as long as they're doing that law, that's all they need to do. And yet, these guys were trying to twist the law and try to make them line up and do the same exact thing so that they could not actually do all the other parts of the law. And Paul was like, look, look, that's not what it is. If you claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you understand the true power of the cross and what the cross means and what the cross has done, and that you would learn that there's nothing but the cross, then you wouldn't need a law. Because laws are fickle. They will be one way today, and someone will change them tomorrow. Fifty years later, decide to change a law. I'm going to take a moment here. I don't know where you stand on Roe versus Wade. Don't want to know. But what I need you to know is this. That overturning of the decision was not for what you think it was about. There was another spirit underneath that. They say it's about making sure that life can continue to be. However, if you look at the statistics of the world, there are certain communities that are dying more than others. And so they turned that law over so that with hopes that their community would rise, one. Two, regardless of all the laws in the world, who can make you do what your body does? To change a law, to tell a woman what she can and cannot do with her own body, that is definitely not of God. Each of us are responsible for this temple. Each of us have a relationship with God. Each of us have the same spirit of God moving in us. And that spirit, how we grow, how we move, allows us to be who we're supposed to be. There should be no law that legislates how you should live in your body. The reason why laws exist is because somehow we've forgotten that we can actually have some self-control. But if you pick a law and so that's what they were trying to do they were trying to say hey this law should be like this and you should be all the people should line up like that and the problem with that is that if you do one part of the law and don't do all the laws somewhere along the line someone's going to get hurt they're going to die they're going to struggle they're going to wrestle. They're going to not have the life that God wants them to do. But if you would just follow the law of Christ, Amen. which is to love your neighbor as yourself and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, if you do those things, there would be a peace. And you would have mercy for those that are different. Beloved, this day I want to encourage us to live as creatively as we can, to live our life fully, 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 but live ourselves and let us be the church that Jesus is calling for us in this season because right now there are some of us that need to be more creative in the places and the spaces where we live, changing some things so that it will be in accordance and in the will of what God's greater kingdom is supposed to be. And I know there's somewhere in this world people need grace, they need peace, and they need mercy. And so as long as the world needs that, they need us to live creatively. Amen.